a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the world. <laughs> Don't know the words, but it's really good. <clears throat> Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. If we get interrupted by some little grunts during this video, this is why. He's just so grumpy right now. Today's video, we're gonna be talking about spina bifida. So if you guys don't know our story or his story, he has spina bifida and was diagnosed with it at 20 weeks gestation at our 20 week ultrasound. And we have been on a journey ever since then. And we've gotten a lot of questions um, throughout this whole thing really, but especially since he's been born about spina bifida, about his specific um, complications and wanting to just know more about it. And we personally know that before we heard it come out of the doctor's mouth for the first time at that 20 week ultrasound, we've never heard of spina bifida before. So we can imagine that a lot of you guys probably don't know what it is either, or don't like, you can look it up on the internet. It'll give you a general idea of what it is. And I'm gonna give you a like, a general overview of what spina bifida is, but I just wanted to make a video here so that if people ask me on Instagram or YouTube, I can reference, reference this video um, and kind of educate you guys because since he has it, we do want to let people know and bring awareness to it. Okay, so first things first, I just wanna talk about what spina bifida is. Okay, so spina bifida is a birth defect that is diagnosed during um, pregnancy, usually. I have had a couple people message me and say that they didn't, um, they weren't diagnosed with spina bifida until later on in life. His type it is and can be diagnosed during pregnancy, um, typically like at a 20 week, 18 to 20 week ultrasound. The spina bifida means split spine. It occurs during the first month of pregnancy when the spinal column fails to close. At the opening, many of, many of the body's nerves are exposed and oftentimes are protruding, causing damage to the body from that point down. What happens is when the spine is basically exposed, the nerves that are all around the spinal column and spinal cord are exposed also to amniotic fluid, which causes nerve damage. And the farther up that the lesion or the opening on the spine is, the more nerve damage that happens and the more um, supposed complications there are with like later on in life. Because the higher up your spine is, the more like organs and, and stuff is affected. When you are diagnosed with spina bifida, or when you have a baby diagnosed with spina bifida, there are a few options. The number one option that they give you, and they gave us multiple times, was termination or abortion. And the there's a statistic, and the statistic is that over two thirds of babies diagnosed with spina bifida are aborted. And that's also 65% um, of like that, that two thirds is 65% of babies diagnosed with spina bifida are aborted, which um, we could never ever fathom now that we have him. It was never even an option for us ever. So that's the number, that's the first thing that they, um, the first option that they give you. And there's two other options, really now three, but there's prenatal surgery or intrauterine surgery. And then there's postnatal surgery. Prenatal surgery, intrauterine, is what we did with him, and it's becoming way more popular. A lot more hospitals are doing it now. Um, but there's two different types of surgeries that you can get for prenatal, and that's the open surgery and fetoscopic surgery. Open surgery is where they cut you um, both vertically and horizontally, and they open your uterus completely. And fetoscopic is where they just cut you vertically, and they use laparoscopic tools um, three, the size of about like the tip of your finger to um, go in laparoscopically and close the spine. There's only two hospitals in the country right now who do a fetoscopic and that's Cincinnati Children's in Baylor in Texas. And we were lucky enough to qualify for fetal surgery and it's hard to qualify because there's a lot of um, things that you have to have or have to be um, a lot of like qualifications obviously that you have to have which is you have to have a anterior placenta which i had you have to be under a certain weight you have to be in good health having no other health concerns um and not have any previous c-sections and i qualified for all of those which is amazing so the difference between the open surgery and the fetal surgery is that the open surgery is obviously way more um intensive extensive it's opening your uterus completely and um, what that looks like afterwards is that you are pretty much, not pretty much, you are 
guaranteed that you will not be able to ever have a vaginal delivery after that. So with this being our first baby and me really wanting to have a vaginal delivery with him and hopefully other babies, we really, really were praying that we qualified for the fetal surgery, fetoscopic surgery. Because with the fetoscopic surgery, because it's only three holes instead of opening your uterus completely, you um, the, the risk of labor, the risk of a vaginal delivery is like the same as a pregnancy that's not high risk. And so we were really hoping for that and we qualified for that and that's what we ended up having. And then the other surgery that you can have um, is the postnatal surgery. And that's just where you go throughout your entire pregnancy um, and like everything's not, or you know, everything's the same as a pregnancy that's not high risk. And then you, when your baby's born, they go into surgery within the first day of life. And the complications with that is that if you wait until after your baby is born to have the surgery, and this is what our doctors told us, that um, babies with spina bifida have something called um, Chiari malformation. Not every single baby has it, but it's typical and seen most often with spina bifida babies. And basically what a Chiari malformation is, is a herniation of the brain into the neck. And it happens because the spine is exposed. So there's a lot of pressure pulling down on the brain. And what the surgery in utero is supposed to do is to reverse Chiari or help reverse and also prevent the um, need for a shunt after birth by up to 60%. So if you wait till after birth to have the postnatal surgery, the likelihood of needing a shunt is 80%. So with that being said, um, we were giving all three of those options. Abortion, termination was never an option for us. And um, fetal surgery was very scary, but it was gonna give him the um, best opportunity. And since we were offered it and we qualified for it, it was, it was the option that we went with. So with spina bifida being, they call it like the snowflake defect, every single case is different. Um, not all spina bifida babies or pregnancies with a baby who has spina bifida are um, able to qualify for prenatal surgery. So they don't even have the option of doing prenatal surgery, they have to do postnatal surgery. And again, like because it's a snowflake defect, you could go throughout your whole pregnancy with um, and your baby's diagnosis by bifida and they're born and they still have full function of their legs or they don't have Chiari or they don't need a shot. It's so, it's so um, specific to each different case. With that being said, also, he, his lesion or his um, opening was at L4 to L5. And I've had people say, uh, ask questions like, um, when is he getting his ankle braces? Or when is he getting his glasses, his spina bifida bifocals or something? Um, or when will he need a shunt? As if all of those things will happen. And what you have to understand is, is again, every case is different. So just because he has his lesion at L4, L5, and there's another baby that has a lesion at L4, L5 and who is um, in a wheelchair or is using ankle braces or f freely walking on their own, doesn't mean that he, his life or his complications or whatever you wanna call them are gonna look the exact same as that baby. We don't know. We won't know until he grows up, until he gets older, until he walks, so he can tell us stuff. Um, we just don't know and every single case is different. So the um, there's no reason to make assumptions about what he will have or won't have in the future because nobody knows. So earlier I mentioned the need for a shunt. So what happens with um, spina bifida is that um, there is fluid buildup in the ventricles in the brain, which is something that we um, really followed closely with him developing in the womb still. They pay really close attention to the ventricle size. And if the ventricle size gets too big or abnormally big, 
um, they will do something that's called placing a shunt and it's brain surgery basically. It just is, have the definition here. Uh, due to pressures on the spine and brain, many spina, spina bifida patients are also diagnosed with hydrocephalus, which is fluid on the brain. And 80% of spina bifida pa patients have a brain shunt to aid in the draining of the fluid. And what a shunt is, is it's they put like a tube in the ventricle and they put it all the way down into a different body cavity to empty the fluid. Most babies who have hydrocephalus, um, if they're born and they can see it right away they'll have a shunt put in right away which is something that they really looked for when we were in the NICU was um seeing the size of his ventricles to see if while we we're in the NICU if he would need a shunt but they can need a shunt at any point in their lifetime um but the thing is is with the shunt I don't know the exact statistic but I do know that when you have a shunt the likelihood of needing to get that shunt um, redone or get another shunt in the future is very high or multiple shunts so uh, we're definitely praying on that too and we actually go to Cincinnati and um, a week from yesterday to uh, have another MRI of his brain to see his ventricles to see um, what's going on other um, just general complications of spina bifida are mobility concerns uh, severe bowel or bladder issues, latex allergy, and like I said, the Chiari malformation. So when I say mobility concerns, um, it, since it's affecting your spinal cord, motor capabilities and motor skills can be impaired. And again, the lower the lesion, the less um, motor complications there can be. So for him, they said that he might walk, they're not sure, um, but the further along we went in the pregnancy and the more that they look at his feet the likelihood of him walking is very very high like they haven't really told us that he won't walk um what might happen though or um what we might see in the future is that he just might need ankle braces or some um braces on his what is this called what's this called shin like from his shin to his ankle but again we don't know um, we won't know until he starts walking with the with the bow, bowels in the bladder, um, there uh, the nerves that make those organs work properly can be impaired. Um, and again, that's not with every single spina, spina bifida baby with spina bifida, but um, most most babies tend to be catheterized, which is just like a little little tube that goes into the urethra to help them empty their bladder. Um, and some babies need to be catheterized their whole life. Some don't need it at all. Some need it just periodically. It just depends. And then the latex allergy thing, I'm not really sure what that's about. I'm not really sure where that comes from. We don't know if he has a latex allergy. We've used latex gloves on him before and he, nothing ever happened. So I don't, I don't, I don't really know. A question that we have gotten a lot since he's been born is, did the surgery cure him? And the answer is there is no cure for spina bifida. Um, and that's something, that's a really big reason why I wanted to make this video because the surgery doesn't cure anything. Um, what it does is help prevent further complications in the future and possibly reverse the Chiari malformation. It doesn't really change anything that has, it doesn't change any of the damage that's already been done, if that makes sense. So basically when people are asking, um, did the surgery cure his spina bifida? You're asking, did the surgery do what it's supposed to do? Which is uh, hopefully reverse Chiari malformation and prevent any further complications from happening. And he still does have Chiari, um, but as of right now, there's no seen uh, evident effects of that, but there might be in the future, don't know. And the uh, other reason of get, having the surgery done in utero was to prevent the need for a shunt and as of right now he doesn't need a shunt so the answer is kind of yes it was very successful and the fact that we were able to keep him inside until a 36 weeks gestation is huge because um we were told multiple times that getting to that point getting that far when i had uh, both separated and ruptured membranes is huge um we were told in the NICU that most babies that they see born with spina bifida are born way earlier than he was born so it's another reason why um everything looked so good we think is because he was able to stay cooking a little bit longer 
and have some more time to heal and develop. Look at that leg go. Show him. Show him. <laughs> Just doing all your moves, huh? Also, spina bifida is not totally, totally preventable. So I've had a couple people say, were you taking enough folic acid? Or did you take folic acid? Did you take L-methylfolate um, folate acid? And the thing is, is I could have been taking the exact amount of folic acid or methylfolate that my body needed. And this still could have been the outcome. What I'm trying to say is even with appropriate folic acid intake, spina bifida is not fully preventable. It's considered a multifactorial condition because because it can originate from a variety of avenues. And I've had people say, did you get tested for the MTHFR gene mutation, um, which is a whole nother thing. And no, um, I was, I've was i been told a lot of different things. One thing I've been told is the MTHS, MTHFR gene mutation is associated with midline defects, which is what a sp uh, spina bifida is. Um, but I've also been told that MTHFR gene mutation has nothing to do with spina bifida and midline defects, so I have no idea, but the answer is no, we did not get tested for that gene mutation. We might in the future, we might have him tested, but um, either way, it's like not gonna make that big of a difference to us. Okay, now I wanna talk just a little bit about him because I've also had people say, what are his complications um, or what is like the, what are the things that you're seeing that are, um, that have been like beneficial from the surgery and stuff like that. So when he was born, um, the very first thing that we looked at is the closure on his spine. They wanted to see if uh, the closure was completely closed and if make sure there was no signs of infection and there wasn't. It was really good. They were like almost immediately concerned when he came out, but he his butt was so cheesy and his back was so like cheesy from the vernix that they really could not like make a good um, a good accurate evaluation so they cleaned him up and looked at, him again, looked at him again and they were like no it looks really good there was just a scab left um, so what happened with him was when they do the spinal closure in fetoscopic surgery what they do is they take the skin from either side of the opening and they um, basically pull it together and close it what happened with him was there was not enough skin to pull the skin together so they had to use patches um, to help the skin kind of like grow over that. So instead of his scar being just a straight line kind of like my belly is, his is more like a, a round scar. Um, so they there was a scab left over where the patch was still trying, the skin was still trying to heal over the patch. And then when they took him to the NICU, one of the very first things that they looked at, actually the very first thing that they did was get him in for a head MRI to see his ventricle size. Again, because that's the biggest thing that they were um, that's the biggest reason he was in the NICU, was to see if he would need a shunt. And he did not. His ventricles are normal. And um, they looked at a couple other things. They, they did a lot of testing. They did a fluoroscopy, which that is a test where they put a catheter in the urethra and into the bladder, and they put um, dye in it, and they see what happens with the bladder and the kidneys. So if the bladder refluxes back up into the kidneys, which they are able to see with the dye, then that is an indication that um, he might have um, some issues emptying his bladder in the future, um, or he might have issues with incontinence. It's kind of like they don't know which one it would be, and he had no reflex, which we prayed so, so, so hard about because that was a huge, huge thing for um, him. Um, and they're gonna do that test every time we go back, which is every three months. We go back every three months to Cincinnati Children's to see all the specialists. And then um, when they came in and they, the PT did his evaluation on his legs, they did a couple different like things, like gravity tests and um, different motor skills. And she said that he was amazing. He passed every single one. He looks really good with his motor skills. He, um, the only thing that they said that we need to help him on is that he likes to plantar flex. He doesn't like to dorsiflex or the other way around, I can't remember. He likes to do this one, he doesn't like to do this one. So we basically are just um, helping stretch those muscles out. That doesn't, that's not an indication that he will have issues in the future. It just is we need to help him stretch it out a little bit. 
Um, but other than that, the physical therapist said that she was really, really, really happy with his movement. And you guys can see every time I post on Instagram or I've even posted on YouTube, his feet go crazy. Like he does not have an issue moving these legs, moving these feet, moving the toes even, which is a miracle in itself, honestly. Another test they did was a spinal MRI just to see um, the closure and like more closely than just what they can see on the outside. And they said everything with that came back really good too. Everything was normal or as it should be. And yeah, it's just his auditory, aud auditory? hearing test came back um, with flying colors. His eye, um, his eyesight came back great. So basically what I'm saying is that the, all the doctors have given us nothing to be concerned about as of right now. Will that change in the future? I don't know. He's one month old and there's a lot of things with um, spina bifida that is not seen until later in life or as they grow and develop with, um, you know, walking and um, stuff like that. And when they're able to say like, oops, I had an accident and I didn't mean to, I couldn't control it. Those types of things that would indicate some like bladder issues. But so far they have said that there's not, nothing to be concerned about and there's no reason based on what they've seen with him and the testing that they've done that there would be anything like that in the future. But again, we don't know. We have no idea and we will update you guys on the victories and um, the really exciting things that happen. So thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for being interested in his story, interested in spina bifida, the questions, um, wanting to know about him and about the, um, the defects are really encouraging that people just wanna know, but also know that um, it's something that is still very sensitive to talk about because we don't know. It's just everything is so inconclusive and up in the air. <laughs> But he is still a little miracle. He has seriously defied every single odd that the doctors have placed in his way so far. I mean, when we were in the in the hospital for 10 days, we one of the nurses, that was a big fart. <laughs> one of the nurses was um, with us and we were like, we're trying to get out pretty soon here today or tomorrow. And she was like, that would be the, the shortest NICU stay for this surgery that I've ever seen. And we ended up getting out like the next day. So it just shows that God's hand is so, so evident in his story and his body and his healing. And we're so grateful for Cincinnati Children's um, and the doctors who performed his surgery and who um, really helped us be able to be at this point. We love you guys so much. Thanks again for watching and we will see you in the next one. If you have any specific questions, then you can comment in down, down below and I will try to answer as many as possible. But we're still learning all of this. We're fresh, new, and um, we're gonna continue to learn as we go. All right, bye guys.